Oh yeah, Steyr Hammer. All right guys, we're gonna be talking about a really, really interesting pistol today. And uh, it's weird because I've had this handgun now for going on about two years and I haven't been able to get it to run right. I had to replace a couple of parts on it. Um, but a very, very unique service pistol. This is a World War I era uh, Steyr Han, also known as a Steyr Hammer. Um, it's a model 1912. Um, this one, particular one is dated 1918. It's dated in a couple of places on the slide and on the frame. Very, very unique handgun. And one of the reasons I want to do this video is because I am such a Glock fan. And this uh, gun does come from Austria, all right, the home of the Glock, right? So Austria was the first country to adopt the Glock, all right? Austria was also the first co uh, country to adopt such a unique service pistol. Now, um, you notice that I fed it with a stripper clip, all right? So it's a Mannlicher style design. It does not use a detachable box magazine uh, like many other pistols do of the era. Um, it's like the Mauser broom handle, which uses a non-detachable stripper clip fed uh, magazine. Um, it fires a very unique cartridge. It's actually called 9mm Steyr. It's not too far from like 9 by 23 um, Basically, that's about what it is. Imagine 38 Super, but at lower pressure. Um, it launches a 115 grain bullet. Actually, the original military loading, if I'm not mistaken, was a 117 grain bullet. Uh, but it launches a light 9mm projectile uh, at a gingerly 1100 feet per second. Um, ballistics wise, you know, it does kind of get trumped by the 9mm Luger just because it's a little more modern of a cartridge. Um, these early guns, they just weren't designed to handle quite the pressures um, that some of the later guns were designed to handle. Um, these guns were used all over the globe. Early on, uh, Romania, uh, Chile, uh, both those countries wanted these guns and they had contracts of the Steyr Hammer for other countries. Romania ordered them, Chile ordered them. And of course, um, Austria used them. Uh, the Vermont in World War II actually ordered uh, about 60,000 of these guns in 9mm. So these were used all the way up through World War II. Now granted, uh, the Vermont you had enough of these guns to you know, supply their army at the time. Um, but um, they wanted some for rear echelon troops, um, policemen, radio operators, that kind of thing. You know, so a lot of your rear D troops use these guns in World War II in the Vermont. Very interesting handgun. Let's see if I can get it to run right for me here. It is a very finicky pistol, guys, so bear with me here. All right, I'll show you the loading procedure in a little bit more detail. Let me don my uh, hearing protection here and uh, we'll shoot it some more for you. I'm just gonna load it a few cycles and then I'll discuss the loading procedure. Certainly not something you're gonna load in a tremendous hurry, but better than a revolver, I think. All righty. What kind of thing we gonna shoot here? Let's try our gongs again. Shoots very good. All right, loading procedure is quite simple. On the last round, the slide locks to the rear. Okay, this lever over here doubles as a safety and as a slide lock, okay? Push the slide lock up and it locks the slide to the rear. Take your ammunition that's loaded on an eight round clip. Yes, it is a clip. The clip loads the ammo into the magazine. All right, guys, get your terminology right. Okay, and that pushes in. Discard the clip, pull down the slide stop, the round automatically cycles into the chamber for the first part of the firing cycle. The gun is in single action and it's ready to shoot. If the soldier wasn't going to shoot the gun right away, of course, apply the safety, put it back into the holster, and off you go. Pull the safety off, the gun's ready to shoot. All right, let's try our little poppers there. So we're down in the trenches in World War I and we got to take care of a bogey in front of us here. We'll see what we can do. There's one. Oh yeah. All right. I can really see where soldiers in World War I down in the trenches would love to have this handgun. It, it, it just feels powerful when you shoot it. It's got the power factor. It's accurate. This thing is just great. Uh, let's try a gong. Uh, let's try our 18 by 24 there at 20 yards.
All right, prints over there to the side. Well, cool. All right, so loading procedure again. Lever up, cartridges, depress down into the magazine, ready to shoot again. So see, in a combat situation, in a hurry, you could probably get to the point where you'd load that gun pretty freaking quick and get those rounds back where you need them. I'm gonna try a gong out there at 50 yards with this thing. That's kind of far. Now, they did have a couple of uh, machine gun versions of this thing that were awesome. It had a 16 round mag, single stack, that popped way out the bottom and a shoulder stock and they were select fire. So if you can imagine troops running through the uh, trenches with these things in World War I and brrr, you know, shooting at each other with them, uh, really goes to, to help you respect what those men went through back then. War was really, really nasty back then and guys were just, were dying left and right. World War I was a really nasty war. And I tell you, um, I have a soft spot for older firearms and because it makes you remember what those guys went through. Helps you appreciate the guns a little bit more. All right, let's try 50 yards here, see if we can put them on the, on the spot there. Oh yeah. There we are. Did not lock the slide to the rear, that's okay. She's old, we'll give her a mulligan. Get some more rounds in it because I got the bad guys trying to kill me here. Got to get this thing loaded. All right, so that's pretty quick. I have to admit, that's faster than a broom handle. All right, let's try our 100 yard gong. Uh, I, I, you know, the sights are fixed and non-adjustable on this thing. So see if we can hit our gong at 100 up there. It's kind of a long way, but let's try it. Oh, I see where it went. Uh-huh. Uh-oh, got a malfunction. It's okay. All right. All right, so speaking of malfunctions, all right, so we just got a malfunction. So what we would do is we'd lock the slide to the rear. All right, so if you want to clear the pistol, I'm going to show you guys how to clear the pistol. So say I put the round back in it. Okay, so say there's a couple of rounds in the magazine and I want to top it off, all right, or whatever. There's one of two ways to do that. I can lock the slide to the rear for the loading procedure, just like I did with a stripper clip. I can top it off with loose rounds, or let's say I'm about to, to do a run where I'm gonna go through a trench and we're gonna have to you know, take an objective or whatever and I don't wanna you know, reload my pistol. All I do is simply pull this lever down. All the remaining uh, ammunition, when I pull this lever down, ammunition pops right out. Grab a fresh clip. The slide is still st uh, locked to the rear. Load the gun with a fresh clip, back in business. So you can see why the troops like these things, because it, it lends itself really well to trench combat. And they did hold up really well in the trenches. They, uh, you know, mud and grime, they, they seem to do really well. So let's try that 100 yard target again. Maybe the little gun was trying to tell me something. It's going, nah, don't shoot me anymore. I don't think you can do it, but I think I can hit it. Let's try it. And bear in mind, guys, in World War I, you know, some of the trench, the lines in the trenches sometimes were as close as 100 yards apart. So imagine you got a handgun that in World War I in the trenches, you can shoot at somebody 100 yards away. You never know. Let's try it. Rest my case. All right, let's try again. Uh-huh. You better get down, bad guy. Come on now. <laughs> Man, it, uh, it slings them in there. I'm not missing by much. But uh, this thing is just great. So again, slide lock to the rear. Top her off. Back in action. Just that quick, guys. These things are great. And bear in mind, this is 100-year-old technology. This gun is 100 years old. 
All right, I want to see if we can take out some of our evil sodas out there. Kind of a small target, we're about 20 yards away. Let's see if we can hit them. Oh, barely budged him, look at that. Just to the left of him. Oh, come on now. I think I'm hitting a little low, it's okay. There he is, okay, I know where to aim now. See if we can take him out. There's one. All right, rest of those soldiers are giving me the evil eye. I better get this thing topped off. There are no mulligans in combat, guys. It's okay. <laughs> there he is. Oh, come on now. Get him now. <laughs> Man, that, that 9 millimeter styre round really pelts the crap out of those soda bottles. Let's see if we can nail another one here. <laughs> I love it. It's great. That's pretty quick. Now, you know, I didn't fish those out of my, my gear. You know, if I were a soldier, I'd have to fish them out of the gear a little quicker, but I can really see why the Vermont, you know, even into World War II, you know, when you've got guns like the Luger, um, the P-38, you know, even into World War II, I can see why the Nazis liked this gun because it is very reliable, you know, reasonably so. It's reasonably accurate and it's powerful to boot. When you shoot it, even the sound of it, you can just feel that sound it's got. It, it just feels powerful. Does that make sense? No, but <laughs> all right. Um, tell you what, I'm gonna try it one-handed, like maybe a, an officer might have done. You know, maybe one-handed. I'm, I'm gonna try just kind of turning my body a bit, shooting the gun one-handed, and see if it'll cycle with me just running one hand here. kind of hard to pick that front sight up. It is a very, very odd sight picture and the sights are pretty much non-adjustable. It's pretty quick. I can't top a broom handle off that fast. I really uh, enjoy this gun. All right, let's try our gopher there. He, he's been looking at us the whole time. He's going, hey, you're not gonna try to shoot me with that 100 year old piece of crap, are you? Well, the answer is yes, I am. I'm gonna shoot you. You little turd. There you go. Took out his backbone. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Look at that group I'm shooting on him. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> that little turd. <laughs> That's the only thing I can call him. But guys, this gun is just really neat, and I, I tell you, I've, I've had this gun for a while, and I've, I've wanted to show it to you guys, and I just haven't had, I haven't gotten it to run right. I uh, ended up having to replace the cartridge stop, because the way this thing operates, when the gun cycles, the only thing holding the rounds in the magazine is a little bent piece of sheet metal that just kind of rides over, and for some reason it, it had wore out or something, and I ended up having to replace it. Um, Bear in mind that if you are going to buy one of these to shoot, uh, the parts are extremely difficult to get. I probably looked around for, I want to say, easily a few months trying to find the parts that I needed to get this thing refurbed. Um, we are going to pull the gun apart in a minute and uh, show you the internals. It's a very, very unique design. Let's shoot it a little bit more. I'm pretty sure you guys are just here to see the gun run and not hear me talk, but let's try a little popper right there. Right on the edge. There we go. Look at that. 
just to the side of him. Here she is. All right, we're gonna try to just kind of rapid fire, close in, like I got bad guys kind of coming at me. I'm gonna work my way from left to right, just see uh, how good I could keep them off of me if they were coming at me with bayonets fixed or something. All right, here we go. Ah, the one guy would have got me, I guess. I missed him. That's okay, my subordinate next to me would have uh, got it while I, while I top this thing off, finish him out. Wow, things just got a great feel to it. I've shot up a lot of ammo, actually a lot of valuable ammo. That's another thing to uh, consider, guys. The ammo for this gun is very expensive. Uh, it's about 40 bucks a box for 50. Um, for some of you guys that reload, um, you certainly can, can roll your own ammo. You can use standard nine millimeter projectiles if you want to reload it. Um, you can use nine millimeter Largo brass, trim it to length, run it through a uh, nine millimeter Largo die and just load it to pressures consistent with the nine millimeter Steyr cartridge and it should feed and function just fine. Um, there's not a whole lot of data out there for this gun in terms of guys that have done a lot of reloading with it. Um, I could imagine that the way the rifling is on this thing, it would really launch a cast projectile really nicely. And uh, that's about it, you know, an old World War I uh, war horse Stripper clip fed, eight shots, Austrian, so you know it's odd like those crazy guys that invented the Glock. Unique pistol, and um, I've really enjoyed owning it, and uh, now I've, I really enjoy owning it because I can actually shoot it. Um, the holster, some of you guys are probably gonna ask about the holster. Uh, this particular holster is a reproduction, but it's made on the original pattern. It's got a 1914 date, consistent with the holsters that would have been issued to troops. And of course, it's got a little pouch here for extra ammunition. And the gun just rides in there quite nicely. Okay. Gun rides in there just fine. Okay. Very interesting. Now, one of the things about this gun I didn't mention before that to me is a really interesting fact about it is that this particular pistol was co-designed by the original guy that invented the Steyr Roth. Now the Steyr Roth was a gun that came around before this gun. And it was equally crazy, striker fired, so really, really odd gun. Like one of the first striker fired guns was the Steyr Roth. And again, stripper clip fed, very obscure. And that guy that helped design it was actually Czech. So you know how much I'm into Czech pistols, you know, ZZ 52s, 82s, 83s. 75s, you name it. If it's Czech, I enjoy their pistols. They make really unique firearms. So I, it doesn't surprise me that this gun would come from the brain of a, a guy that's Czech. So they helped uh, design it. And uh, just a really interesting system. Um, the barrel actually locks and unlocks a lot like a Beretta PX4. If you've ever seen that gun, it's got that kind of rotating you know, breech. It operates on a very similar principle. Um, very simple gun to disassemble and take down. Uh, this particular one, I don't quite remember if the barrel link is in very good shape or not. I don't want to hit it or strike it much. But if you guys are familiar with early uh, black powder revolvers, you know that like on a Colt, you know, 1860 or something like that, they would have that wedge pin that you can push out to disassemble the gun. Well, this gun uses a, uh, a very similar wedge up front, okay? Now that wedge would be pushed down and out, and then the gun, you pull the slide back, up and over, and the recoil spring is actually maintained in the frame of the gun, and this wedge pulls against that recoil spring. So once the wedge is out of the way, the recoil spring stays captured. So as a, a combat gun for you know an average soldier, this would have been a very, very easy gun to maintain in the field. So it is, 
you know, I know it's a little crazy looking and a little intricate looking to some, um, but they are finely machined, finely made pistols. And uh, I can see where it would be a very acceptable military pistol uh, for troops in the trench or wherever they gotta be. So uh, I do appreciate you watching this video. I know it might've been a little bit long and drug out for you, but we tried to keep it very simple um, because this gun, it, it just reminds you of a simpler time. You know, when uh, people, people just thought different back then. You know, it was, it was a different world back then, both, both from a combat standpoint and from a standpoint of freedom and liberty and just an everyday life, it was a different world. I mean, a hundred years ago might as well have been being on Mars compared to being here because the way technology has advanced in our current society, um, there's just a lot of, lot of people that don't realize that a hundred years ago there were men in overglorified ditches with stripper clip fed, uh, you know, new fangled automatics. You know, automatic pistols were a new thing back then, you know, not a lot of people had semi-automatics. Um, a lot of the Austrian troops were still issuing gasset revolvers, which, although powerful and accurate, were very slow to load compared to this. Um, you know, this gun represented uh, the apex of military technology at the time. It was the best they had. Um, you know, if you were on Sam Juan Hill, you know, back in the day, I'm pretty sure those uh, guys on Sam Juan Hill would have loved to have one of these other than a, you know, revolver. So. It just really goes to show you the technology and we're very jaded these days. And uh, back then, you know, those boys made these things work. We're gonna shoot a little bit more here. Didn't lock to the rear. Little guy may be getting dirty, that's okay. Got a little bit more ammo here. We're gonna shoot it one more time and uh, close today's video out. Very, very cool. So again, slide lock to the rear, clipping the gun, safety down, gun's ready to shoot. I'm gonna try that 50 yard gong a little bit more. That one's kind of messing with me a bit. That's it. There it is. Just under him. <laughs> 50 yards for an old 100-year-old gun. It just goes to show you, you know, if you take care of your stuff, you treat it right, it'll last forever. You know, guns are extremely robust, extremely well-made, especially back in this, this day. And uh, I tell you, you take care of them, they'll take care of you. And this, this old 100-year-old pistol is a perfectly good example of, you know, heirlooms. You know, you take care of a gun, you treat it right, you keep it clean, and one day your great-grandson I mean, who knows? I could be the great, great grandson of some Austrian stormtrooper who, uh, for all I know, for some odd reason may have left this gun to me in some weird way. You know, even though I didn't get it from him, it's just weird to think that, you know, how things come into your possession and how you end up having them. And I think for me, that's the, the whole thing about military guns that I like so much and why I, I feature them so much on the channel is because it, it's just their origins, where they come from, who had them, the stories behind them. And to me, that's just something money can't buy, you know, just guns are neat. And they all have their own little histories, their own almost personalities. You know, this gun has its own little personality. You know, even though there are many others like it, this particular one, it's like, you know, they just all have their own little quirks about them. So if that's one thing I could drive home in this video would be that for older guns, you know, even if you're not into older firearms, you should probably get a couple of them and you might find that you'll get kind of hooked on them with time. So uh, I'm gonna close this video out. Uh, this was a lot of fun making this video. These guns shoot so awesome. They're so much fun to play with. I strongly suggest you pick one up before they get too hard to find. Price-wise, uh, you can pick these things up on the low end for about 450 on the high end, 600 Some of the Nazi contracts, you know, they only made 60,000 Nazi guns, and of course some of them are very hard to get these days. Some of your Nazi contract pistols can demand upwards of $1,000, but compared to a broom handle, very reasonably priced, very easy to find for the most part. They are out there, you just gotta look. Guys, I appreciate you watching today's video. Sorry if I rambled on, but uh, 
We'll catch you next time. Have a good one.